Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Kelly Wilkins uh, from My Self Reliance, welcoming you to the Kawinda Community Connection. This is where we get together every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Sydney time. And we at My Self Reliance like to bring to you the best skills and education workshops and speakers to discuss the ways that we can get off the grid and get out of the system and become free and independent people. So if you're the, here for the first time, I'd like to welcome you all. And I actually normally say welcome everyone. And then I heard I heard this phrase that was, that was um, uh, it's important to bring back our genders. So, so I decided I'm going to welcome everyone as ladies and gentlemen, just to make sure that we are, we know who we are. So thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, if you uh, are the first time here, you may not have known that we have just come off the back of a two weeks summit uh, where we had 20 speakers over 10 days talking about all things um, to do with self-reliance, money, education, uh, finance, grow your own, all those good topics. And if you'd like to go back and have a look at those on our um, uh, the recordings of those, then you can jump into the Telegram group, um, or sorry, the website, go to myselfreliance.com.au and you can get that recording at a discount. It's $25 for all those speakers. And you, if you watch them, you can go in and vote for your favorite speaker. There's four categories. Um, you can vote for your favorite speaker, the best presentation, your the topic that you'd like to hear from again, and the speaker that you'd like to hear um, from. So you can vote in the Telegram group and then you get to go in the draw for to win a worm composting course or a box of worm, uh, worms or a tray of uh, microgreens, depending on where you live in Australia. And then, of course, our speakers get uh, prizes as well. So lots of fun um, there. And, and also stay tuned. We, we are announcing. Um, the the information for our festival coming up on the 20th to the 22nd of October held at the Wiseman's Ferry. Um, it's going to be lots of fun. And really what that's all about is to bring together all of the things that we are learning on this channel, putting them into practice um, at the festival and really creating, creating that community um, that living off the grid kind of community. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to our guest speaker tonight. Now, this is probably my I'm most excited about tonight's topic uh, more than usual because we're talking about food and food security. And on the weekend, um, Emma and Andrew who were able to go to the Wolke Farm, and we're able to take a tour and learn from uh, Jake Wolke, who we have with us tonight. And, it, you know, they came back raving about this experience, and I wanted to share um, with you, we, this has been on my mind and on my heart for a while, and we didn't cover this in this summit, but it's so important to get really ahead across food security. So welcome, Jake. Hello, thank you. Thank you for having me. Jake, thanks for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, you led everyone on a great tour uh, of your farm. So maybe just introduce for us all what is it that you do uh, and and then and then maybe share with us about what what's important to you about food security. Sure. So uh, my wife and I own Walkie Farm, which is a stacked enterprise regenerative farm here in Aubrey, New South Wales. So by stacked enterprise, uh, we mean that we have many different productions happening on the same pieces of land. So 
on our farm, we raise beef, pork, chicken, lamb, eggs, honey, and we also breed schnauzers for the pet market, standard schnauzers. Uh, and, you know, we do all of that in a chemical-free way. We're, we're, we're not intensively um, spraying and fertilizing our crops. Everything's trying to mimic natural systems and, you know, really mimic old McDonald's farm. Try, try to do it the way that our ancestors have done it for a long time. Mm, beautiful. How long have you been on that farm doing that? So all of our land we lease. Uh, we currently don't own any agricultural land for a range of reasons, which I'm very happy to get into if you want to. Uh, we took our first lease over in 2019. Uh, I was on a bit of a health journey. Uh, I like to describe my previous self as a snotty mess for a long time with uh, allergies, you know, respiratory allergies, uh, skin rashes, you know, things like that that just plagued me all my childhood and uh, most of adulthood until. 2019 when I started knuckling down on uh, what I put in my body you know our, our western paradigm we're so focused on uh, fixes you know to, to suggest that you can cure something almost sounds a little bit woo woo you know I, I was taking scripts for eye drops tablets and and nasal sprays daily to try and uh, push my allergies back to a man manageable level just so I could function and no one in the industry that I ever saw for help. And I spent a lot of money and a lot of time in, in offices and clinics over, over, you know, probably a 20 year period. No one ever said, have you ever noticed that your symptoms flare up when you eat different foods or put yourself in different environments? Yeah. It was just never a question that was asked of me. So after we sort of gave up on, on a, you know, if nothing changes, nothing changes. <laughs> We're getting to the point where I was at my wits end and my wife said, how about we clean up your diet? Because at that time, it was iced coffee and satay and noodle boxes and KFC, a uh, absolutely woeful intake regime. And we started going back to basics and, and we went down a rabbit hole and decided that we wanted to grow our own food without chemicals on it. And uh, that was probably about 2018, early 2019. And, and then all of a sudden, we realized that heaps of other people wanted this food as well. So we we, instead of just running cattle and sheep for ourselves, we got to, you know, to move five cows a day is the same effort to moving 20, 40, 50 cows, 100 cows a day. So we decided to get a few more and see if we could sell them. You have, now you said about you don't, you lease the land and you don't own it. Tell us more about that. Well, in my area, you know, we're on the river flats of the Murray River and farmland even an hour away from Albury is still fetching $10,000 an acre. And my main lease block, which is very central to Albury, without a house on it, it'd still probably be $13,000 per acre. So let alone it being cost prohibitive, you know, if you want to get started, like our, our main lease is 100 acres. And anyone who's in agriculture will, will laugh at a 100 acre farm because that's a hobby block. You know, that's the size that the house paddock is. That's the house yard, the shed yard, and, and the paddock out the side where you keep a few ponies. No one's doing anything meaningful on 100 acres. But that's $1.3 million. Mm. You know, that, that's, a, that's a lot of equity required to, to start your uh, business from a, from a standing start. Mm -hmm. if, you were to, if you were to take a, a bank loan out on that at the, at the current interest rates, you know, just for one acre, you, if, if you just say you're paying 6.5% interest rates, you're paying close to a thousand dollars a year, you know, hundreds and hundreds. Like I can lease that same land for one hundred and fifty dollars a year. So the goal for us is to manage the land, not to own the land. So we're not against the land land ownership. You know, we we we'd love to own heaps of the stuff, but at the moment, managing the land is the stepping tool to um, you know, ramping up our production and and growing our business bigger. Well, that's good to know. We're we're currently looking for land and to 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 do the same and so what you're saying is it's actually more equitable to start leasing and then building up your your putting your money into the the animals and working the land rather than owning the land absolutely you know the, the value for us that like we can't we if we own the land we can only sell it once but if we if we manage the land and have cattle on it we can breed them manually 
you know, and sell their and sell the the meat that we're producing off them every year. So just to give you an idea, at a six percent interest rate on thirteen thousand dollars an acre, you're looking at seven hundred and eighty dollars per annum. That's just an interest. That's no principal repayments in that. And I'm leasing that same land for one hundred and fifty dollars an acre. So, you know, of course, when you own the land, you get appreciation. You don't have to worry about landlords. You can live there. You can put the silo where you want it. You know, you don't have to worry about things being unsightly. There's lots of benefits. But, you know, I can see us uh, scaling the leased land uh, that we're, that's under our management forever, irrespective of however much land we purchase. Mm, that's really great. So, and then that means you're able to increase your production now tell us about how you manage your animals uh without chemicals this is the the, the way of the future or it's, it should have been always the way right regenerative um but we're coming back to that now sure well look we've we've got a few we've got five production values on our farm we call them our um, pillars of production uh, and the first one is, you know, we, we talk about them being in sequence. And if you get a piece of the puzzle wrong, uh, you can't get the outcomes that you're wanting. So the first production pillar for us is animal welfare. And and animal welfare to us is a little bit different to what you might hear about or, or see on TV or whatever it is, you know, caged uh, pig factories, you know, that are raising all their pigs to meat inside big sheds. They cut the tails off their pigs. For the pig's welfare because if they don't cut the tail off the pig uh, while they're in their pens and they're all bored their neighbor's going to chew it off them so for that animal's welfare they cut the tail off to save it being chewed uh, our version of welfare would to be putting pigs in an environment that stimulates them and mimics their natural environment and doesn't stress them out and um, freak them out and doesn't push them towards the behavior where they becoming carnivorous on each other so when we're, when we're trying to look at an animal, we want to think about what its natural expression is. Where does this animal come from in the wild? Where would it normally live? What's its normal diet? So, the, you know, I ask people, what's a pig's natural expression? And every, you know, I have 60 year olds on the farm doing farm tours and they, oh, me, 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 me. They, they wallow, they build wallows. Everyone knows that a pig builds a wallow. Well, almost, almost no one has ever eaten pork from an animal that's from a pig in Australia that's had the opportunity to wallow. You know, the 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 pasture raised free range industry is is you know extremely small compared to cage production. So we're just really trying to go back to basics and look at what the animal's natural expression is, look at its natural habitat, and then honor the animal and and give it that opportunity because their natural expression is is for a good reason. When a pig wallows. It's cooling itself down. Pigs can't sweat except for the tips of their nose and a few glands above their trotter. So it cools them down, puts a mud mask on them so they can't get sunburnt anymore. And if they've got fleas, ticks or lice, they drown them off. So, you know, the pig's got this um, natural uh, way to look after itself from parasites, you know, external parasites. And then we take that away from it and replace it by pharmaceutical inputs like drenching. You know, my grandpa had a small piggery 60 years ago he used to drain, um, he used to pour some oil along the pigs to kill the ticks, but then they slept on concrete. If they could just go outside and build themselves a wallow, he wouldn't need to go and get any sump oil from the local, <laughs> you know, the, the local mechanic shop. So that's step number one. Step number two is we want to look after our environment. We love our environment. We, we want our farm to become more fertile, uh, healthier, uh, more abundant, more productive. And you know, I, I really deeply believe that animals are good for the environment. We've we've been we're being sold the Kool Aid. You know, we're having the tofu shoved down our throat that animals are bad for the environment, and it's just an absolute nonsense. You cannot find a healthy, thriving ecosystem in the wild that is operating separate from animals. Now, animals are the environment, and I think that's part of an agenda of self-loathing because. We have a role in our environment as well. And if we can demonize the animal impacts, the animals are bad for the environment. Just imagine how bad we are for the environment. It's mm. just a nonsense. But you can treat animals, you can farm animals in a way that's bad for the environment. You can put cows in a feedlot. You know, cows roaming the pastures is fantastic, but cows in a feedlot, not so good. So we love our environment. And we believe if you look after the animal in step, with its natural expression, honoring its welfare, by default, the environment's going to be looked after really well. 
We, our third pillar is we want to create healing food for our community so people can enjoy the health outcomes that we've enjoyed. And we get feedback about this almost daily, how, you know, somebody's child was allergic to eggs or somebody was allergic to beef or somebody couldn't eat pork or, um, you know, somebody's transitioning off a vegan diet and they're eating our food and the turnaround, it's given their life, you know, no longer they're surviving, they're thriving. And that's something that we're really uh, passionate about. So we want to create healing food and it's not it's not tricky to create healing food all you got to do is look after the animal properly which in turn looks after the environment properly and when you've got animals and environments that are healthy not needing chemical inputs you know they're not drug addicts anymore your natural byproduct is going to be the produce that we're meant to be eating production value number four is we want to build community which is why we put ourselves out there and open up our farm and let jake get out on the pasture and ranch for four hours on the weekend. And uh, step number five is we want to be profitable. Uh, we, we don't, we don't, uh, we don't mince our words. We, we need money to live. We need income to pay our staff. And I unashamedly would love to scale our business a hundredfold because, you know, every extra dollar of income where we're bringing in is, is reflective of another pig that's out of a factory farm, another cow that's out of a feedlot, and another chicken that's out of a shed, uh, and and so we're able to re to rescue these animals from confinement, factory farming, restore landscapes, and provide healing food for our community. So we can't scale without good cash flow and a profit. So that's the that's the fifth pillar, the nail in the coffin. What does it mean when people say they're free range versus pasture raised? Great question. The the I'll, I'll preface by um, saying that all phrases are, are eventually bastardized. So you know we're currently saying bast we're we're currently promoting ourselves and our industry is promoting ourselves as pasture raised. And if if listeners learn what I'm about to tell them, they'll start looking for pasture raised. But it's it's very likely that one day in the near future that the phrase pasture raised will become greenwashed. And greenwashed is when big with when big corporate interests regulate the word uh, and and uh, turn it into some sort of compliance regime and then because they want to put it on their label to grab some of the consumer confidence that we built out of the grassroots movement. So free range used to be a really nice term. It used to be not in sheds, but now you now free range animals, if people could see the conditions they were in, they they would feel like they've been sold the wrong end of the stick. So to give you an in, to give you an idea, uh, free range chickens, uh, to hit the requirement for that, you need one square meter of space per bird outside available for access, which is 10,000 birds per hectare. Now, if you put all these birds, if you put 40,000 birds in a big shed and put some doors on the sides of the shed and, and there's four hectares of, let's say there's one hectare uh, of space that the birds can access on each side of the shed, they're never going to leave the shed while feed and water and nesting boxes and shade and friends are all inside. There's no incentive to go outside for them. And even if they are in an outside environment, the, the free range uh, model is static. You know, they'll have a one, let's say, that, let's say the, let's change up the production model. Let's say it is all outside and exposed and there's 10,000 birds in a hectare. There's no onus on that farmer. There's no requirement for them to keep their livestock moving. They've, give, they've met the space requirements so they don't need to move. Now, where in nature are animals static? You know, birds are not static animals. They don't set up camp and live in the same spot forever. So the reality is that uh, almost immediately, you know, very short term, we, we, I'd, I'd say within three or four weeks, you're going to start to see environmental degradation the, the, and the place is going to start stinking and the animals are going to start, uh, you know, becoming sick and not thriving. So on a pasture-raised farm what we're trying to do and other people in our movement is respect those natural systems and we keep our birds moving all the time so our birds are in little portable shelters that live on pasture i build mine out of old reclaimed caravans that i pick up online cheap and i, I modify them and we move them all the time so our chickens get moved twice a week we drive out there in the morning and we hook it onto the ute and then we we drive them wherever they need to go whether it's 20 meters this way or two kilometers that way and we're always taking them to fresh pasture to move them away from their manure and put them into a new clean environment. Ah, uh, so that's that that's hard to do when you've got cows roaming around and things. You must have, uh, but anyway, that's another question. Um, so when you've got this production set up, then 
um how what what's the process then of getting your your farm to market sure it, it became very apparent to my wife Anne and i very early on that processing was the biggest bottleneck you know out of everything we do farming's the easiest the the, the there's basically um four different things we need to do we, we need to grow the produce we need to process it so get the animal slaughtered and butchered uh, we need to sell it we need to find people who want to buy it and then somehow we need to de deliver it so we've got freight logistics and the processing the sales and the freight logistics are all more difficult than the growing of the meat itself uh, in our current climate so we realized very early on that there was a bottleneck in that so we purchased a local butchery uh, which was it was not an ongoing business it was purely the freehold that we purchased and we put a full-time butcher on. We've now got two butchers and a packer in there. So we have to send our animals off-site to local state certified abattoirs to be slaughtered. And then the abattoir delivers the animal back to us in our boning room at the butchery. And then, you know, we do whatever we need to do to it, whether we're doing, you know, sausages or bacon or chops, whatever it might be. Uh, everything gets cryovac labeled and frozen. We, we almost exclusively sell all of our produce frozen. Uh, because our our production seasonal, so I've got you know seventy uh, lamb uh, ewes in the paddocks lambing down at the moment, and when all their uh, weather lambs are ready for processing in a few months' time, I'm going to have fifty ready all at once. Uh, so so we process them all when they're ready, you know, when it's the right time for the animal, when it's the right time for the farm, and then we can freeze down that inventory to get us through the next few months of sales. Um, and so we've been, we purchased that butchery in late 2020 and we, we do that custom processing for a dozen local farmers as well. So they send their animals to slaughter and consign them to us and we offer them that service. Mm, that's awesome. Do, do you, are you under regulations so that you get um, to bypass the NRA injections and, and other regulations be, to be able to do your farming practices the way you want to do it? We are regulated and, and some enterprises are regulated uh, more than others. And because of how many different things we have going on, we're sort of a ticking time bomb. Uh, so, you know, I've, I've got the state regulates me for uh, egg production and uh, chicken production in general and my pigs because chickens and pigs are classed as intensive livestock because you have to import feed for them they don't uh, exist purely off pasture alone because the, you know they're not herbivores they're they're omnivores so they need more food uh, cattle and sheep are largely unregulated because they're classed as extensive agriculture i'm not needing to import feed for them uh, because we have the butchery uh, that's another regulation. We get surprise health checks and audits and that sort of thing there. Uh, and we also have a restaurant in town where we do all our paddock to plate meals uh, and that's regulated by the local council. So everything else is the state and that's the council. To answer your question about mRNA injections in animals, to my knowledge, uh, there are no mRNA injections or mandates for injections in Australia yet. Um, Australia has... Uh, a very rare trade status globally because exports are a huge part of our market, our red meat market. We export premium beef and lamb to Japan, South Korea, China, and other very you know, lucrative markets. And we have a trade status that's clean and green. We're one of the only places in the world that doesn't have foot and mouth disease. And if we, the traditional you know, um, the traditional virus vaccines, like dead virus vaccines, that sort of thing, we can't even own them on our continent without losing our export trade status. Because as soon as we own of that vaccine uh, here in Australia and hold it on our land, we're classified as having that disease here. So Australia actually owns millions of these traditional vaccines sitting in a warehouse over in the United Kingdom in case there's an outbreak here, then we can um, freight it in quickly and, and, you know, whatever, whoever wants to do what they do, does it. So at the moment, they're not using any mRNA because we'd lose our trade status, but they are developing it and testing it uh, and manufacturing it because they're quicker to make uh, and they're cheaper to make. Um, so if at the moment there's not, I get asked this every day, there's nothing out there to my knowledge. Uh, and I've, you know, I've got a few friends in industry that assure me of that. But if there was a foot and mouth outbreak, uh, it'll it'll be chaos. You know, the 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 food industry will 
it'll be like COVID, but for animals, it'll be complete lockdown. Uh, wherever there's an outbreak, there'll be an exclusion zone. So just say there's an outbreak in Albury, they'll draw a 30, 40 kilometer ring around Albury and they'll just shoot every animal. They'll shoot, every, they'll just come and cull every single transmitter to try to stop it from uh, taking over the country, like what they're doing with burning all the beehives with Varroa mite, uh, which is ongoing you know I, I i sort of thought you've been going for so long now you'd give up the ghost like it sort of just seems like it's it's never going to get a handle on it now um and will it will it be regulated and you know i i really i really don't know um how or, or what but i i could i could tell you that in my opinion intensive industries wouldn't even blink a, a blink an eyelid to roll it out in intensive industries being um, chicken and pork are all intensive. Uh, dairy is intensive, you know, and, and um, feedlots are intensive. And the reason they wouldn't blink an eye is they're so used to standards, procedures, audits, mandates, control orders that they just get them in the mail. There's a new one every few months, and it's it's not political for them. It's not. It's like just get on with business, print out the new control order, give it to the staff, and go and execute it because you know this is what we do. So the only people that would be able to, um, uh, you know, potentially uh, resist or, or come up with alternative methods would be uh, pastoralists, people that are, you know, extensive agriculture, grazing animals on grass exclusively. So with the, um, what, what you, if you're having a look at the meat that we have in Australia then, are we importing meat? Or are we yes. safe with what we go and buy in the shop that it's going to be okay? I mean, not not beautiful raised like your meat, but yeah. well, I've I've heard I've heard that in America they've already um, using mRNA vaccines in the pork industry. Mm. Um, I don't, you know, I'm not an authority on this. I'm just scratching around, reading information like everybody else. But I've I've, I've uh, actually saw a farm tour. A video of some keynote speakers of a farm I follow in America, and I think it was uh, Robert Malone that was talking about how the pig industry is uh, using mRNA vaccines, and Australia does import. So we import pork. Mm. I don't know if we get any if we get much from America, but if you go to the supermarket and buy very cheap pork, you know the stuff that's on special, and it's a rolled roast or a, or a ham without a bone in it. If you look at it, it's very likely imported from Brazil. Uh, and the fact that if if you buy a piece of pork that's got a bone in it, you can almost be assured that it's Australian grown pork because it's a, it's illegal for these suppliers to import pork cuts with bone in it because marrow is living and it can be affected to transmit diseases. Uh, so they've outlawed the import of any pork products with bone in it. But, you know, we import a little bit of everything. So it, you, you just have to read the label because if it's Aussie, Aussie, um, grown, there's always a label indicating that we're, we're probably, uh, I, I would say that Australia are global leaders in in the, the integrity of provenance with um, the, the food labeling. Like in America, it, it's, it's a real nonsense. You can buy beef that has a sticker on it saying um, USA grown and um, raised and grown or whatever, when in reality, it was actually grown in Brazil killed in Brazil, freighted into America and butchered in America. And the fact that it was butchered in America attributes enough processing that they can say, you know, grown in America or raised in it, produced in America, whatever phrasing that they use. Uh, it's, it's fully greenwashed. But in Australia, as far as I'm concerned, our labelling is currently quite good. Mm, that's good to know. Um, and, you know, the, what I'd be more worried about down the track too is the 3D printing of meat. So, so to avoid all of that what's um and and for our own food security sake you know we want to all kind of come direct to the farmer and be able to um skip the the chains and not support the big the big um food chains how do you distribute out to the people well i you know, we, we service locally so people can pick up at our butchery or we 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 wholesale to a few different supermarkets um we shipped out we ship meat boxes into melbourne so i've currently got melbourne freight running quite nicely so if people purchase from walkiefarm.com.au they can just buy preset meat boxes and we ship down you know order gets picked up every wednesday morning 
I'm currently working really hard to get Canberra, Sydney and, you know, North and East Coast sorted. But, the you know, the freight's a real challenge. None of the couriers want to touch me because I don't have pallets and pallets of uh, weekly orders ready to go. I want I need to start with boxes before I can get to pallets and no one, nobody wants that. But I'm not the only farmer in Australia uh, doing this. There's, there's, we've got plenty of um, great pasture-raised, mixed enterprise, organic producers uh, around the country and you know you can weasel them out you can ferret them out go to the farmers markets um, ask your local homeschooling group are there any good farms around the place you know tap into different networks and you know the, the thing i'd encourage people to do is i get i get asked all the time does your meat have mrna in it mm-hmm. and i explain to them what i explain to you no it doesn't and they go oh that's um that's so good to know we're trying to find a supply for um for when the vaccine comes into the country and then they don't buy anything off me they go back to supporting Coles um, while I'm like busting my butt trying to get a meaningful business going. And, you know, if there's an outbreak, I'm going to look after people who have already been supporting me. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to um, take these people that are drift that have, you know, called me two years ago to see if I, how I produce things. And all of a sudden they're interested when it um, is convenient to them. We're going to look after our own first. So I'd encourage people to you know, go and shake the hand of the rancher in their local area, their local farmer, and get and get to know them. Audit them. Don't don't trust your little farmer just because someone's selling at the farmers market doesn't mean they've got good production models or they're trustworthy. Uh, you know, we believe. Um, don't trust. Verify. So, if your farmer doesn't do farm tours or won't let you on site, you know something's fishy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to the processing there's a way to to process that is um and you talked about it as your first step you know that's um i can't remember the word you used like humane and the way that you do that so that so that it retains the best of the the animal can you talk about that how the the way that you treat your animals and also there's a question coming through about you don't dock the sheep and lambs tails um yeah so yes well at the moment to to answer your first the first party question to 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 slaughter our animals to uh currently we have to use offsite abattoirs mm. uh, we we would love to have an onsite abattoir um my wife and I are in the you know to juxtapose the first comment I made about leasing land we are in the process of purchasing land uh, because we live in town, we want to live out of town with our children. We've got three children, um, hopefully ten more to come, and mm-hmm. so we want to go live out of town. And we're we're in that process. And I would love to have an abattoir on site, a small little bespoke abattoir where we can look after our own animals and walk them in straight out of the paddock and all of that sort of thing. But we you know we need a critical mass of production and value being generated to get there. So the more people that can get on board and and you know support our operation, the quicker we can get to those goals. Uh, in regards to docking sheep's tails, you know, why would an animal have a body part just to get it cut off? You know, it, it's it's like cutting the beak off a chicken, which happens. Mm. It's like, you know, cutting the foreskin off a human. It just makes no sense to have body parts and then go and get rid of them, you know, for, for, for no reason. So the reason sheep tails get docked is because we've selectively bred sheep um, to have wrinklier skin and denser wool because then we can get a high yield of wool off them. You know, if, if, a, if a sheep, if a merino ewe has a really wrinkly skin layer, we've actually increased the surface area per sheep. We can get more wool off them. But then in, um, in summer when they've got a big woolly coat on them, and all their dags, all their poo stick into all that wool around the bottom and all the uh, all the maggots and flies come in. It's a real problem for the sheep. So, you know, welfare would be to cut the tail shorter and trim that um, hair off, that wool off. But we have selected a breed of sheep that just loses its hair. So we don't get a wool crop. Uh, we, we don't shear our sheep. They're a hair sheep and it just falls off. So because we've selected an animal that I believe is is fit for purpose, you know, they've got their own innate natural tools uh built into them to deal with this instead of me needing to take to them with a knife yeah what so tell me more about the fit for purpose so should you look for an animal that has its specific purpose so 
you know, if you're going to have uh, chickens, you'd have them for meat, not for eggs, or is that what that means? Absolutely. Well, there's there's fit for purpose to me yeah. is trying to find livestock that's um, hasn't been adulterated and and take had all their t- tools, natural, you know, God given tools taken away from them because we've tweaked them for our own production values. So, you know, one one example to steer you away from um, food production to to paint a bit of a picture for you is French bulldogs. You've got a little dog here that can't naturally copulate because we bred them so short and stumpy that the penis can't penetrate by themselves. So uh, either you can buy little swings online and put the dog's front legs through it and hang it over a door frame and lift it up and then hold the bitch underneath it to get bred. Uh, or you can do artificial insemination. Uh, and then when the mother's ready to give birth, you know, you, you notice a French bulldog's head is about half the size of its body. Uh, if you look at a German shepherd, or, or, a, or a schnauzer or any of these other breeds, that's not the ratio. And these little puppies have heads so large that if mum pushes them out, uh, it cracks her hips open. So all French bulldogs are delivered through C-sections. Uh, you know, there's outliers, of course, but this is the industry norm. And then the little puppies' legs are so stumpy that they can't push themselves up onto mum's teats. So they're um, put on by hand or bottle fed for the first couple of weeks. And then you've got a dog that's a... Um, complete basket case they've got short little faces they can't pant properly because their throat's all blocked up with all this fatty um, material because they've got such a short face so they can't regulate body temperature a lot of them sneeze and their eyes bulge out they've got skin uh, they've got grass allergies imagine a dog being allergic to grass you know the list goes on and on and on and not to sort of belittle anybody that has a french bulldog they're cute they've got great personalities but the reality is if we took 100 and put them in a paddock and came back in five years there'd be none left And that's not fair on the animal. You know, we did that because we like the look of it. And that's the only reason. So from my point of view, those animals are not fit for purpose. But if you took two German, I've got one of my lease blocks down in um, Cancun, which is just south of Aubrey here, has um, wild dogs there. And they're descendants of German shepherds from when the um, German tradesmen were uh, building Dartmouth Dam. They used to put an Alsatian down the bottom of their sleeping bag to keep them warm. And a heap of them ran off and, and mated with dingoes and all sorts of things. And they've just thrived. And that's an animal that's fit for purpose because it can do its job by itself. So we're trying to find those animals within production. Now, I want to swing back around to the health side of things. Uh, and because you were talking before about uh, how you got your health back from being on the farm. Um, and you've discovered all kinds of things about health through through farming. Um, yeah, share with us a bit of that journey. When I was younger, my dad had to come in in the morning and peel the sheets off my legs because I'd been scratching my skin while I was asleep and my legs were bleeding. And uh, that we did that ceremonially for years. Uh, I used to go to a GP every few months to get my script refilled for um, no spray tablets and eye drops, three scripts that I needed to help me handle my symptoms. They never got rid of the symptoms. And in retrospect, I don't know how much they actually helped. Uh, I used to go to Melbourne. I did about a year's worth of going down to Melbourne every month for a desensitization shop. You know, we did the, we did the stick test of all the things you're allergic to. I was allergic to dust. I was allergic to grass. It's allergic to flower pollen, uh, animal hair, you know, like it's just everything. How do you exist in, in the world without being allergic to those things? And it just plagued me forever. And I told the story at, the, at both events on the weekend that one day, I'm just going to plug my laptop in because I didn't realize I was getting low on juice. One day I went to the local GP and I said, look, I've just had a gut full of this. I can't exist any longer by being um, having all these symptoms. They're just absolutely killing me. I need some reprieve. And I begged her for a steroid shot. I, I had a friend who recently had a steroid shot and he was talking about how good his symptoms felt. And I thought, well, if it gives him a little bit of reprieve, maybe there's some hope for me. And I um, I begged her and, you know, to her credit, she said, no, she said, look, you're young and healthy and they've got bad side effects. They thin your bones, whack up your metabolism, ruin your hormones. I'm not going to give you the steroid shot, but I will turn the juice up on your scripts. And I went and cashed in the scripts and I had a really bad side effect to one of them. The nasal spray she gave me, I put in my nose and immediately both my nostrils just 
turned open like a tap and I just had blood pouring out of my nose. It wasn't dripping, it was pouring. And I laid down on the side of the street out of the front of the pharmacy where I purchased it, um, you know, pinching my nose, trying to, to stop it. And I just thought this is an absolute nonsense. And when I spoke to my wife and, and you know, we sort of just had this long ongoing conversation. She's always been a lot healthier mm-hmm. and a lot more health conscious than I have been. And she said, well, let's just really have a go at, you know, getting our, getting our health in, in order. And then from that, we started doing organic gardening in our backyard. And I went right down the YouTube rabbit hole. You know, how great is YouTube? We've got all these amazing resources, you know, uh, books and local clubs and stuff. But YouTube is really amazing because listening and watching things in real time can really, uh, you know, make it easy to absorb. And I just went down this YouTube rabbit hole and I ended up coming across uh, livestock farming while I was going down that. And I thought, yeah, you know, some chemical free meat sounds like maybe it'll be a good piece in the puzzle for me. So that's how we got there. So I heard you talking on another um, podcast. It was the, on the lead up to your tour weekend and um, about it, it, the meat diet. So is that what you do now? Is that kind of part of your your regime or do you incorporate all kinds of foods? Tell us about that. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Yeah, we, you know, in Wolke world here, we are meat-based. So we eat a predominantly meat diet. You know, there's a lot of eggs, a lot of cheese, uh, honey, and seasonal fruit. But we don't really, you know, it's, it's a bit ironic to me that our whole uh, journey started with organic vegetable gardening in our background. And we, you know, almost exclusively don't eat vegetables anymore. But, you know, it's it's basically the ultimate elimination diet. If you if you look at all these different elimination diets for people that are trying to find foods that are bad for them uh, or, or, or make them react, uh, this is really the ultimate elimination diet because meat is ancestrally appropriate for humans. So if you, you know, I'm not trying to convince anybody to eat only beef for the rest of their life. There's, there's you know, people out there trying to do that and that can be their mission. I'm more about getting animals out of factories uh, and, and onto pasture. But if you could just, when I started my meat uh, diet, I went back, uh, my wife and I, and we ate nothing but meat for about four months. It was it was meat, eggs, and dairy for four months. We had no fruit. I don't think we ate honey at all. And we felt really good, but it's not the easiest diet. And not that diets should be easy, uh, you know, but, you know, it's a little bit restrictive on your social life and it's hard to get out. And so we just, after those four months, we felt really good. Uh, I, my snoring stopped. Uh, I lost, lost a stack of weight. All my skin was the best it's ever been. Um, I've, I've never been able to breathe through my nose before. And, and that diet coupled with taping my mouth while I sleep, I've naturally opened my nasal airways. Like I've got cousins that have actually had their nasal airways bored out to help them breathe through their nose. And they said it was the most horrendous uh, pain and recovery they've ever gone through. And six months later, their nose is closed up again because they didn't have that um, body reflex of nasal breathing. And because they didn't use it, they lost it. I've actually been able to train mine to be um, opened naturally without the, uh, without the surgery. So we just reintroduced things and we're feeling really good on a seasonal fruit meat-based diet. Yeah, way to go. Um, now, there are some questions coming in from the chat. So um, you talked about, I'll go back to this one from Nicole, who asked about, um, you talked about having a butcher and 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 sending your meat off to abattoir. So I don't know, you know, if, if, if it was difficult, I think the question is, if was it difficult to come across the butcher that you wanted to, yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. You know, yeah. I talk about something called food intelligence. We've lost food intelligence. If anyone's been to grandma's house, you know, out the back near the back door, there's a meat safe. There's a big wooden structure with four fly screen walls. Um, you know, who listening here can honestly say they would know how to place meat in that, how long it could sit there um, before it went and rank, how they could take it out, prepare it before they eat it. Like we have no idea. You know, that was a staple skill. That was just reflex to everybody. 
um, while refrigeration wasn't, you know, commoditized and available everywhere. And, and we've lost that to our detriment. Um, so the same, is with, the same is with butchery. There are people getting their qualified butchery ticket now that don't know how to bust down a whole carcass because they're working in production lines doing boxed meat and they've all got very specific jobs and, and they've got very specific skill sets. And because with a business like ours, we need generalists. We need somebody that can look at a whole pig hanging on the rail, a whole sheep, a whole cow, and know how to do everything with it. Whereas the industry is training people to do one cut, next one comes along, one cut, you know, to be very uh, mechanized for efficiency sake. So I have found good butchers, but they're few and far between. Uh, that's one of the reasons sheep production is so interesting to me because to teach somebody how to break down a body of beef properly, you know, I'd say if you had somebody full time with you and you were spending, you know, eight hours a day teaching them how to break down a full body of beef, you know, I'd say I'd just throw a, a dart at the board and say four months before they became proficient. Uh, I reckon you could teach somebody how to break down a lamb in a day proficiently. Uh, there's so fewer cuts. They're smaller, easy to handle, and everything's cut bone in. Um, it's, it's a lot simpler. So I really like the lamb production aspect of my business because it fixes a labor right at the other end that's got nothing to do with far farming. It, it fixes a labor gap. But like my, my butchers have no idea how to cure meat without preservatives. Like we don't know. I went around and asked all the local butchers, how do you do preservative-free bacon? And um, one of them uh, kicked me out of his shop told me he wanted nothing to do with me because I was going to kill people doing preservative free things, you know, and then there's one local butcher that does know how to do it and he's not going to share his proprietary knowledge with competition. So I've had to go, I've bought all these curing books, all these state of the art meat curing books. None of them know either. So how did I figure it out? I had to go and read literature from the 1800s. Wow. You know, yeah, I had to, I had to go right back to roots to figure this stuff out. And then the method, the methods that we found, um, aren't recognized by regulation. So then we're having to go through this whole rigmarole to try, try to validate these um, time-perfected practices. Like the whole thing's just ridiculous. If you had someone come onto your property who who wanted to, um, authorities and, and wanted to tell you different things, what protections can you... Um, afford yourself so that you don't let them on your property or that they don't shoot your whole herd what can you do look realistically there's nothing you can do if you're a registered producer like i am you know we it, it it's not fair it's not right you know say whatever you want uh but you know the 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 government's the biggest gang it, it's it's backed by the it's backed by the army try not paying your taxes you know, like you can, uh, you can have all these, uh, you know, I've, I've got a few friends in the area, area here that would probably classify themselves as um, uh, sovereign citizens. And they've got a few uh, different ideas on how they're going to treat land taxes and income taxes and things. And, and one of them's on a bit of a showdown at the moment. And whether he's, whether he's read something in the original constitution and interpreted it it correctly or not um who's gonna who's gonna physically defend him if they've de if they find him guilty you know so i think you know part of it is um you, you just have to you have to play the game to a certain a certain degree with the current climate that we have you know i um somebody's commented you know go go private and get unregistered like i, I don't know exactly um you know that there's i don't think those production models are uh, sort of happening here in australia but even in, in america where farmers have stopped selling produce and they've sold you know private memberships to their farmer and they've distributed meat but they're not selling the meat there's one very famous farmer he's a uh he's a um a mennonite i think or, or an amish Amos Miller, you can, you can Google him and read his story. He's been doing it for decades and he's been growing some of the most down to earth, honest to, um, you know, honest to God food in the world. And he's had the feds raise, raid his farm and seize all of his food. He's been dragged through the court case. You know, he's hundreds of thousands of dollars in the drink trying to defend himself. 
And that's in America where they're sort of meant to be on the forefront of all this, you know, civil rights and freedom sort of stuff. So it's, um, you know, if, if anybody's, you know, once you, once you go and get a tick to try to um, actually sell things on a meaningful scale, you're sort of, you're in the game and, and you've got to play the game to a degree. Yeah, yeah, you got to pick your battles, I guess. Decide. My, which my, you the to only go. defense, the only defense mechanism I've ever thought of in regards to protecting the downsides of a disease outbreak is to get all my all my animals on a truck and to the abattoir immediately. Honestly, if there was a foot and mouth outbreak 200, 200 k's away, I'd probably I'd probably ring up the um, abattoir and beg and plead and offer them a heap of money to slaughter all my animals the next day, and I'd hire a truck and I would just as sad as it sounds it'd break my heart but i just kill every animal i had myself and through an abattoir so i could receive all the carcasses and freeze down all the meat because otherwise they're all going to get put on a heap and burnt percent. Mm, yeah what a waste that'd be so what advice do you have for people who uh what are following your footsteps well, you know, to, to, to start small and start at home is easy. If you've got a suburban backyard, you know, everyone everyone likes the idea of having uh, layers in their backyard, but raising broilers, meat chickens in your backyard is actually super easy. I've got a few friends that are on uh, town blocks in Aubrey here, 700 metre blocks, and twice a year they get 50 birds off me and raise 50 birds, moving them daily onto fresh pasture in their back in their backyard. And then, and then they set up a little... Um, makeshift abattoir in the backyard and slaughter all their own chickens. And I just think it's absolutely fantastic. And you should see how healthy their lawn is. It's incredible. The thing's glowing. You can probably see it from space. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I think any production people can take from home uh, and get themselves, you know, that little bit of his food security uh, is a great thing. But if, if people are genuinely, you know, I, I'm I'm predisposed to being a bit of a um, prepper, bit of an isolationist, like that's, that's something that I, I I love going down those rabbit holes, and I've identified early on that um, I can't do it all. You know, we're better together. So instead of having a cellar full of everything and 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 you know trying to do it all myself, we really put a lot of our effort into building network and uh, having a good a good community and lots of good friends around us. So you know, and, and part of that is having your supplier. You know, if if food sovereignty and food security and food access and drug-free food are things that you're interested in, you should really be making steps to build that relationship with that farmer and um, support that farmer now and not just try to keep them in the back of your mind for when you might actually need them. You know, when COVID lockdowns happened and there was a big food shortage, uh, I had everybody wanting to buy beef off me uh, and, and there's only so much beef I could produce so I just gave it to everybody that was already a customer. It's, it's the first in best, isn't it? Like you, you look after those who look after you. So I'd, I'd encourage people to build those relationships. And do you deliver as far as Sydney? I do deliver to Sydney, but the website doesn't currently facilitate it because it's clunky and it's not an offering that I'd, I'd like to offer on the website uh, prior to speaking with somebody. Mm -hmm. So because I, can't, because I can't get a direct freight route yet, what I do is I freight it to a friend of mine in Wagga who's got a catering company um, on a Wednesday and it sits in his cool room, sits in his freezer for a whole week because then he goes to Sydney the next Wednesday. He goes to Sydney every Wednesday, but by the time my courier gets it to him in Wagga, he's already gone. Mm -hmm. um, so if somebody orders from me, if people can call me or email me and I can explain to them how we do it. I can get it up there probably takes 10 to 14 days for the delivery to arrive, which is um, not good enough, uh, in my opinion, but it's all we've got and it's all frozen. It always arrives and it's always frozen. So it's always food safe. And, you know, if I, if I had 20 regular boxes every week, that'd make a pallet and then it'd be easy. But at the moment it's, it's two a week, it's six a week, it fluctuates a lot and we just can't quite crack that pallet rate. Does it depend on the, a demand at the other end for how often you do the go to the abattoirs like like what's the cycle of that if you had a big order in sydney tell us you like do you know what the question i'm trying to ask yeah sure well our our production our processing in the butchery you know relies on two things and that's um supply and demand so 
depends how the animals are coming out of the paddock. You know, it de depends how many animals that I have that are ready for processing. Um, but at the same time, if the butchery is busy and I've got animals that are ready, but I've got no orders or I've got enough stock there, I might hold them back a little bit longer. So it's a supply and demand thing, but we're madly trying to scale our enterprise. You know, like uh, four four years ago, we had we had 20 cows and 30 chickens. Uh, and at the moment, we've got a, you know 120 cows. We're going to do 350 pigs this year. We're on track to do over 20,000 uh, chickens, meat birds this year. Uh, we're, we're really working hard to get our numbers up. And that's all demand driven. We need the orders coming in to send the produce out. So, you know, in it, I would expect by 2024 to have regular freight to Sydney organized and you could just click buy off our website and you'll get it to your door within a few days. That's what we're working towards. So um, what would be a bulk order? What would that make it worth your while if we put together one in our Sydney-based community? Well, I just had at the uh, event on the weekend, There's a, there was quite a few people from Brisbane and they a few of them flew home with meat boxes and they've eaten the meat and they've all sent me, um, you know, nice Google reviews and, and, uh, and nice feedback and they said they want more food. And I said, I can do a pallet. I can get as far up to Brisbane with, with a whole pallet. With a pallet, you know, I could have as little as, uh, you know, 15 boxes on it, you know, probably probably as low as three or $4,000. But I, I could probably put 15 grand's worth of meat um, on a pallet if because, you know, whether you stack them two foot tall or six foot tall, it's the same price you're paying to send the thing. Mm. Um, so, you know, if you go on my website, there's preset meat packs. There's a 20 kilo beef pack. There's a 10 kilo pork pack. Like you can pick the eyes out of it. You can mix and match it a little bit. And I can get those individual orders. You know, one of the foil boxes I send in, it's probably about 40 bucks, 50 dollars to get it up to Sydney. And you could get up to about 20 kilos in one box. Mm. Uh, but if you want, if people wanted to join orders and um, and put, you know, 20 packs on a pallet, I could get a far cheaper freight rate. And that's what we do in Melbourne. We have some customers that do that in Melbourne and also in Brisbane, like I said, and then it gets dropped in a central location on a certain day and everyone comes to that person's house and picks up their box and goes home with it. That's ideal. That's what you want. So um, that's good. We will work something out. If anyone is interested in doing that, uh, maybe uh, you could message me. Um, you could, um, uh, yeah, get in contact. You could put a note on the on the chat or email or text message, whatever you like, and we could talk about how that could happen. Um, so red meat, pasture raised and pasture finished as well. What does that mean? Yeah, we don't feed ruminants any grain. So um, some, some places will ad advertise that their beef is grass-fed but it's still been finished with grain at a feedlot. Uh, and it comes back to our first principle, our animal welfare and what's the natural expression of an animal. You know, a cow a cow and a, a sheep are ruminant herbivores. They're not designed to eat, have a gut full of grains. You know, grain's actually really bad for these animals. So you can put them in a feedlot and feed them grain for two months and they'll put on a bit of weight. You can keep them there a bit longer and give them antibiotics and they'll put on more weight. But if you put a cow in a feedlot, and feed it in a feedlot for months on end and then put a bull in and try to breed it, you won't get a calf out of her. She won't ovulate. Um, you know, and that's a sign from the animal that this isn't what I need. So our our ruminants, our uh, red meat is strictly uh, pasture only, except for our dairy beef. So if you go on our website, there's grass-fed beef and there's dairy beef. And what the dairy beef is, is we buy retired dairy cows out of a local Jersey dairy here in the Kiwa Valley. We buy them because they're um, beautiful cows and they're inexpensive. They're affordable for us. And we use them as a as a, essentially a cheap womb and we breed them with our bull. And uh, when those cows are no longer breeding for us, then we process that beef through the butchery and we label it as Jersey beef because in their previous life, when they were at the dairy, they eat a bit of grain while they're in the parlour. So we, we know that's important to some of our clients. So we declare that. Um, and you, if you order grass-fed beef, you can't accidentally get that. It's a separate product. Now, you do have some events on your farm. Do you want to tell us about the events you have coming up? You just had one, which was huge. So what else? Yeah, we've, 
The next one's coming up November 4th, and it's called the Quantum Health Summit. So we've got Dr. Pran Yoganathan coming back down to um, get on site with us and uh, spruik the good news. We've got Dr. Jalal Khan, who's a quantum uh, dentist. So, so he's, he's a trained dentist that does, if you're in Sydney and you need any uh, any any oral work done or, or anything, you know, if your child's mouth breathing when they sleep and not breathing through their nose, like um, Dr. Khan can help you with that. That's really not good. Uh, you really need that sorted. And he, he's not just a filling, filling tooth kind of dentist. He can really do some amazing things around airways. Uh, he'll be coming. He, he's also a, um, a, a doctor who's really interested in all things quantum. So light, water, and magnetism, which are sort of the, 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 uh, the core principles and building blocks that have established life here and support life. Uh, we're really interested in thriving. You know, we're not interested in in um, subsistence and, and just existing. We really want to thrive. So we're we're finding doctors out there that have done amazing work and really understand things on a holistic level. And um, it's 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 so it's so um, humbling to us because they are so excited about working with farmers uh, that are not interested in chemicals. Uh, you should see how excited these guys get when they get on farm. So we've got those two doctors coming. We've just locked in a, uh, a fourth guest speaker because I'll be presenting as well. Um, I don't know her name because uh, Jalal is still sending me the, Dr. Khan's still sending me the finals, but we've got a lady who's going to be coming and presenting on um, all sorts of cool stuff, you know, how it all ties into women's health, but it'll, it'll be applicable to men as well. So that's coming up November 4th. Tickets are on our website and you can buy in-person tickets or streaming, live streaming tickets with a download link. So you'll be able to watch it after the fact also. Um, and I do do farm tours, you know, all the time, but I just don't have anything on the board right now because we've just had our third child. So I've taken a few weekends off just to settle in here at home. Mm, congratulations. Thank you. So, uh, and your, I guess part of your weekend in November is, is a, a dinner with the eating the meat is that part of it yeah we don't we don't have that itemized yet but uh -huh. with all of our events we we generally always try to do a farm tour and then an optional uh dinner where we book out a restaurant and i supply all the meat to the restaurant and uh and we have a bit of a fireside chat or something and then we have and then we have the event the next day so we you know, we know a lot of people travel for our event, like this Quantum Health Summit. We've already got people that have booked tickets from New Zealand and Tasmania coming over. Um, so we we have the core event for people who, you know, just want to come to the keynotes. But we've also tried to build a whole weekend, long weekend out of it for people that are making that. Uh, what should we call it? It's not a, it's, it's not a journey. Let's call let's call it a pilgrimage. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, it's very, very exciting and, and wonderful to know that you, there's farmers out there who are looking after our livestock and our futures and our food security. Um, and, you know, super important that we get to know our farmers, like you say, and start building that relationship now. Um, you know, not everyone can grow their own. Um, so we have to know where to source it. And so, Thank you, Jake, for you know what you do in your family and um and and going back and doing that research to the 1800s so that you really are getting it right, which is take your hats off to you for that. That's so great. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah. Thanks everyone for your great questions and for being here. And uh, you know, we're back here again every Tuesday. Um you know, I I didn't ask Jake until yesterday to jump on tonight. So you never know who's going to be here next week, but that's always somebody who's going to uh, nourish us uh, and feed us with great information and uh, and this awesome community. So thank you so much again. We'll see you next week. Bye. See you. See you, Jake. Thank you. Thank you.